All right, we have finished the Mimer in Parshat Re'e. It talks about Elul. There is no Mamar, there is no Hasidic discourse in this amazing, beautiful book called Okuti Torah, which was written by the first Rebbe of Chabad. It's got like a thousand pages on it, it's beautiful. Uh, about the, um, from Parshat Shoftim, this week's Torah portion. But there is about the month of Elul, and that's what we just finished learning. Unusually, the Rebbe makes us some a summary. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, he was the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, he used to love summaries. So he used to put them in. But the uh, the first Rebbe of Chabad very rarely wrote summaries, but here he did. So let's go through the summary of the Mimer that we just finished learning, because it, it really is very... Uh, informative about the month of Elul, and it looks at it from a totally different uh, viewpoint, a different angle, and um, and not just a different angle, but a different dimension of reality than, than, than uh, you can find pretty much anywhere else. And it's not like Kabbalah. Kabbalah, the teachings of Kabbalah, they sort of take you out of the world. It teaches, teaches you about what's behind the veil, you know, all these spirot and these aspects of God. And here Hasidut makes use of ideas of Kabbalah, very heavily ideas of, of Kabbalah, but it explains them in a way that, <clears throat> that the, the ideas of Kabbalah, the reason God even created all these spiritual levels and the hidden aspects and mysterious <clears throat> dimensions of reality is in order to arouse us to serve him better, to have more love of God, to have more fear of God. That's the idea of Kabbalah. is supposed to be that we do the commandments with more soul. It puts a soul into the commandments and into the Torah. That's the purpose of Kabbalah. And, um, and those people who are the Kabbalists, the, the people who learn the Kabbalah, that's why it says that a person shouldn't learn Kabbalah until he's learned the whole entire Torah. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is, is that you have to realize that the Kabbalah is just like the soul for the body. And the body is the Torah and the commandments. <clears throat> so really until Hasidut came along, especially Hasidut Chabad, but <clears throat> in general Hasidut, uh, these two things were sort of separated. The, the, the secrets of the Torah and the soul of the Torah and the mysteries of the Torah, these were reserved for people who, like I said, knew the whole Torah, and then they could learn Kabbalah. And Hasidut Chabad, the Baal Shem Tov especially, but the, 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 the pupil of the Baal Shem Tov, and especially the first Rebbe of Chabad, who was the pupil of the Baal Shem Tov's pupil, uh, they brought it into actual practical, day-to-day -day use for everybody, even to a certain degree, non-Jews. Because the re that's the teachings of the Mashiach. The reason that the non-Jews have these religions that they have is because life is very confusing and very empty. And there's so much concealed. You know, wh wh where do we come from? Where are we going to go after we die? What is keeping us alive? Where does... The, the, the good luck come from and bad luck come from and you know is there really a, a controller of the world is the world just like a dream is there no meaning whatsoever we're just sort of you know came from protozoas or the black hole or whatever and just you know just admit it make the most of it like these french philosophers talk about could it be and everybody feels in the world that it's not really so that there must be some sort of meaning and so but what is it so they grasp at all these other religions so that's the idea of Chabad Hasidut, is to put, how do you say, truth, is a, a life into serving the creator of the universe, the creator of the universe alone. And so that's what's going to inspire the non-Jews to drop all their religions, because they're all false. They're, 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 they're denying the closeness and the intimateness, in, intimateness, intimacy uh, of God to each one of us. 
to each and every one of us. God is infinitely he's creating us. He's creating the animals too, but they can't appreciate it. Human beings can appreciate it. And that's what the Jewish people are chosen for, is to teach everyone how important they are. Huh? God is creating everybody, and he's creating everybody for a purpose. And the whole thing is not just to go to heaven or whatever. Heaven is very nice. I'm not denying it. You know, but, but this world is much nicer, potentially. That's why God put us here. He didn't put us here to torture us, to watch us run around like little rats in a maze or something. Okay, so now we're going to, let's go, let's go over them. Maybe we'll remember some of this. You know, I, like I said, they, they say that the pupils of the first Rebbe of Chabad, this is the one who wrote this, they used to learn these Maimori 500 times. And it's not because they had reading problems or you know comprehension problems or they got distracted. These were people that were geniuses and they, they had been learning Torah since they were born. You know, they would expose their father to learn Torah as soon as they could. You know, they learned how to read when they were two years old or something. They were already, you know, reading and understanding when they were five years old. They already knew the whole Chumash. And, and, and they knew the, the Talmud and everything. And a lot of them knew Kabbalah also. But nevertheless, the, the words of the Rebbe were so deep and so unusual to take these, the essence of God and bring them onto day-to-day -day life. <clears throat> to everybody, right, to inspire everybody in everything we do, especially in the commandments and learning the Torah, that they would learn it, every time they would learn it, they would find something new. They say that the first Rebbe of Chabad also, that they, they once he, someone came into his room, his son, whatever, and he saw him learning the Tanya. The Tanya was the book that he wrote. And he was learning it with great, with great uh, concentration. And he looked up at his son and said, you know, every time I, every time I read this, I find something new. He wrote it himself. So he means that he wrote it, but it was it was written with you want to call it godly inspiration. You know, like, a, like you have a genuine mu musician. <laughs> there was a famous story. I don't know if I told everybody this story, but it's a good story. This is what I heard. That Lahabdil, Beethoven, that he wrote some sort of a of, of, of a some sort of a piece, and in it there were there were uh, a part for the violin. Maybe it was a string quartet. I don't know. Anyway, there's a part of the violin that it was impossible for the violin to play. It was either too high or too fast or something that it was impossible. So the violinist came to, to Beethoven and said, maybe there's a mistake. You know, I tried to play this thing. No, I took my advice for it. No one can play it. It's impossible to play on the guitar, on the, on the violin. And, and Beethoven said, I'm talking to God. What do I care about your stupid violin? What do I care? And other words, inspiration is something which is higher than normal, even inspiration in music or in literature, etc., sports. So we were talking that Moshe was, Moses was inspired to wrote what he was, and so is also all the other great Torah scholars. It's inspiration for the truth. So that's what these mimers are. Just a little. Okay, let's go. Now we are going to learn a summary of the mimer we just finished learning. We have to refresh our memories. So we won't learn it 500 times over like the pupils of the first Rebbe did. We'll learn 500 times over, but at least we'll learn it over the, okay, the Elo. We'll see it, do you, do you remember? We'll see if we remember. And the Elo begins begin at the level of this begin at this, how do you want to say, this uh, aspect of Ani Ladodi. We're serving God in a way that we go up to God from darkness. Hainu et rutu de la tata and arousal from below. Again, this is just a summary of the different of the paragraphs that we just finished learning. In the month of Elul, Elul is Ani Ladodi. I am to my beloved. My beloved is to me. Said the Alter Rebbe that the month of Elul is mostly Ani Ladodi. I am to my beloved. And arousal from below. And then Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Then Dodi Lee, then my beloved comes down to me. Then God reacts to what we do <clears throat> and brings blessing and more reality into the world. Hainu, Hamshachat Alokuta Lamata, drawing down godliness below. Mitchila, that's how it starts off. Small Atachat Roshi. That's in. The month of Elo, I'm sorry. His left hand is under my head. 
I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry, not, this is the month of, of Tishrei. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, that's his left hand is under my head. And in Sukkot, which he doesn't talk about here, is his right arm embraces me. So the month of Elul is Ani Ladodi. I am to my beloved. That's the whole month of Elul. And that's what we're learning about here. And the result of that comes on Tishrei when God puts his left hand under our head. That's Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And his right arm embraces us. These are all sentences from Shir Hashem, Song of Songs, King Solomon's love song to the Creator. But Elul in the month of Elul, Yud Gimel Mira Torah, and Elul there are the thirteen attributes of mercy. If so, why is it not a Yom Tov? If there is the revelation of these thirteen attributes of God's mercy, like Moses acquired after the Jews sinned with the golden calf. And God gave him the special gift of the 13 attributes of mercy to forgive the Jews for any sins that they do. So let me just see something. Good, okay. That, so there's the re revelation every day of the 13 attributes of mercy. God is, is uh, caressing us. He's begging us to do truth he's trying to inspire us so why isn't it a holiday why isn't it a holiday so he says the reason is because the king is in the field this is like a king <clears throat> when he's in his palace it's a holiday the king is royal but that the king comes down to meet you when he puts on regular clothes, it's not a holiday anymore, but it's still the king. <clears throat> it's like a king that comes out to Lachville Panova Sud, like a king that you go out into the field to meet him. Then the king is there. It's the 13 attributes of mercy, but it's in a sort of a mundane way, not royal. So the, these days are days of the king is being revealed, but it's not like a holiday. You don't really feel the highness of the king. You just feel the goodness of the king. It's sort of hard to believe it's really the king. <clears throat> Your Hashem, again, let's just get this again straight. What does it mean when God is revealed? What happens when God is revealed? It's not that everybody's faces start to glow and nobody's feet touch the ground. They're just sort of was wisping around, right? And then they, 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 they feel enlightened and suddenly they're, you know, they, they're just, eyes just bulge out or something or they don't eat anymore, and they don't sleep anymore, and they don't answer any questions. They just go, oom all the time or something. What, what happens when, when God reveals himself? What happens? So one thing that happens when God reveals is it's happiness. People feel happy to be alive. People feel happy to be themselves. God is the creator, right? So you feel that God is creating you. You feel the creator. That's what it means when God is revealed. When God is revealed, you're happy. When a person is happy and he's in a positive, then, then it, he can do his work properly to, to, to transform negative things in the world. All the confusion in the world suddenly becomes less confused. That's what happens when God reveals himself. You just become who you really are. Your soul becomes more revealed. You're less concerned with your bodily needs. I heard once a person, this 90-year-old guy, he said, you know, I've been alive 90 years. I had a lot of troubles in life, a lot of troubles, a lot of difficulties, a lot of really hardships I went through. And I want you to know that 99% of them were imaginary. In other words, we make our own problems a lot of times. Sure, of course there's problems in the world, but a lot of times the way we take it and the way this, this increases the problem, what's it exacerbates as we like that. So therefore, when a person feels the creator, then he genuinely feels a sense of, of empowerment and well-being and also certainty. He hasn't got so many doubts about what to do. It says in the Torah, look in the Torah and you'll see what to do, right? I, there's so many other religions that forget it. There won't be any other religions. People only really worship the creator and people know what to do. The non-Jews will do the seven Noahide commandments. And that, that's a whole world in itself. There's not just seven. That's just the name of it. We'll talk about that later. 
Anyway, that's what happens in the month of Elul. In the month of Elul, it says, Yoyah Shamponov, that God shines his face on you. This is the 13 attributes of mercy. That's what's revealed in Elul. Uh, that's what's happening right now. Do you feel it? Well, think about it a little bit. Maybe you will. That's what it means that God shines his face. That's <clears throat> so what it says. That's what it says. There's a pasuk. <clears throat> that God is by this name of Ale, and he shines to us. This is the name of Ale. This is the essence of a Jew. And that's what it says. It says, look in another place to understand what this is. That's Yisrael. Yisar means constantly will rule and constantly rules what is dominant in us. Ale. That's what's dominant in the soul of every Jew. The first of the 13 attributes of mercy. This is what rules in every Jew, this aspect of El. The source of the 13 attributes of mercy. In other words, God's care for us and for the whole world. That's what was revealed after the, 13, after the sin of the golden calf. You have to realize the sin of the golden calf, that was like really big time crime. Right? There was no bigger crime in the history of the world than the sin of the golden calf. Never was, never will be. Sin of the golden calf. All of the Jewish people saw God. All the Jewish people heard God say, don't worship idols. And all the Jewish people did it. They worshiped idols in one way or another, passively, actively. But they all did. Worse sin could possibly be. And God said, that's it. You know, I, you can't have a better proof that God exists than God revealing himself at Mount Sinai and your soul jumping out of your body. That's the best proof of all. So everybody knew that God exists. You didn't read it in any books or anything. They, they saw God took them out of Egypt. He split the sea. He gave them the Torah. He said, just, I'm not asking a lot from you. Just don't worship idols. It's so hard to refrain from worshiping an idol. Who wants to bow down to a stone, to a cow? Who what? Come on. That's all, that's all you want from us, God? That's all? I mean, we owe you so much. You took us out of Egypt. You, you're giving us bread in the, to eat from heaven. Just that one. For sure we won't worship idols. What's the question? And we see you, God, your essence. The creators, we're not going to worship idols. Forty days later, when they thought Moses was gone, they worship idols. That's the worst sin. You can't have a worse sin than that. And then, nevertheless, God forgave the Jews. Why? Moses asked for it. And he, he said, how can I have a trick that anytime the Jews are going to sin in the future, which they probably are. So God gave him the 13 attributes of mercy. And the 13 attributes of mercy show, show how intense and deep is the love of God. In fact, even when there is no cause for love, we said mercy brings it back. Jacob redeems Abraham. Jacob is mercy and and that's the essence of a Jew, Ael. That's the essence of every Jew. Yisrael is this essential, intense, unending, immutable love of God to the Jewish people. Uh, they can do the worst, most terrible, God forbid, don't, don't consider doing it, but they can do it. And God still loves them. What are you going to do? That's why we got all this chasidut here, wouldn't it? Shebuchinus, ale, that's the level of ale. This is what rules inside of every. That was the first chapter. Second chapter, we just finished on Hine, Yesh Badam. There is, and every single person has a city which is inhabited. Like it says, <clears throat> look, etc., another place. And there's also, and everybody has this level of the field. <clears throat> What's the field? The Rebbe is saying, look in another place, etc., to understand this. And everybody also has the, the field is where you. You sort of do the work. The city is where that's corresponding to a person serving God. Then you can really be a real true human being. God, you're aware of the creator. <clears throat> you live a life that's based on true values. <clears throat> Everything you do is what God wants you to do. In your business, with your family, with your children, with your wife, with your friends, with your, 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 uh, the, your competition. Your, you do everything, all the challenges. <clears throat> You take on in the way 
that God wants you to, or at least you hope God wants you to, but at least God is in the picture. That's the sada. I mean, that's the ear. The ear is serving God all the time. Torah, commandments, sada is where you serve God in the world. You go into the world, you can forget God sometimes. You remember? Desert, Midbar is where you always forget about God. There's no God. You don't forget. There's no such thing. Midbar, this is the place where it's not planted that no man lives there. That's the opposite of what it says. Yoshev Elohim, that's what it says. This is the place where God dwells. How can we locate, search, and locate the desert part of our personality and to make it livable? The answer is, what you have to do is you have to search through all of your deeds, your attitudes, your speech, your thoughts, and realize that that's what's covering over your true identity. That's what's causing the desert. Kieta or kito, because the fact of the matter is, is that inside of you is a light that is concealed. That's the way God created it in the beginning of the creation. This is the level of El Hashem Yorolanu. This light of God, this awareness that you're being created, your creator loves you and is creating you for a purpose. This is concealed inside of us. <clears throat> we don't feel this yeshar ale, this yesar ale, this level of godliness. Ah, yesh me. So you have to search. There's some people. This is totally lost by them. Like it says, who is a fool? A person who loses everything that is given to him. <clears throat> a person is lost. Like it says, Ovdim it says that the, the Mashiach is going to bring back, it says, the lost people in the land of Ashur and the people that are pushed away in the land of Egypt. That's what it says. Like it says, I am, I am wandering around like a lost sheep Look in this other place, and etc., and etc., and etc., and just so. Therefore, you have to look in the place where you lost this feeling of godliness. Where is it? In all of your actions, your reactions, your attitudes. Like I said before, look over there, and you'll see how you're fooling yourself and you're hypnotizing yourself. That's what it means. Because the misham, you have to search for God. Where in the place where you're losing Him in your bad reactions to the world and attitudes and goals, etc., Then you will return to God and God will have mercy on you. <clears throat> etc., etc., etc. From this, you arouse, I, one second, what happens if a person feels it does, doesn't help? It says, then he'll arouse tremendous mercy, greater and greater mercy. And that's what it means that the Jewish people are they are grazing in the flower, in the, in the roses. The rose, it says, has 13 petals. I've never checked it out. You can check it out after the class, but it says a rose has 13 petals. And that corresponds to the 13 attributes of mercy. So the Jewish people depend, they are fed by God's mercy. Later on, we'll see that we feed God, we'll see. Also, it says, Rob Shushani, like it says, if your sins are red, then they will, God will make them white like snow. And that's just like the rose that it says in the Zohar that a rose, that if it's exposed, a red rose, we said red, it refers to a person being too involved in the world. It says the red rose, if it's exposed to fire, then it turns white by means of fire. Okay, the Rebbe is telling us to look in these other places and other places. Also, this thing of Shoshanim, the word Shoshanim is roses, but that also the same word is used for learning Torah. Raza the beginning is Baraza Sumka Lususie Chivira. That it says it changes the the secret of turning red into white. 
There he says horses. I don't know what that why. Horses asusie chivera. Oh, this is what it says. The language of zahoris. It says over there that the ah, uh, I'm sorry. The 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 um, on Yom Kippur, the service of Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol takes a a string of a red string, and he tie it, puts it in a place where he can see. And when the goat is pushed off the mountain, the Seir Lazazel, the goat. And, and the, the sins of the Jews are forgiven, so this string turns from red to white. That's the whole idea of the, the garments, the white garments of the coin and the golden garments of the coin. On Yom Kippur, the coin goes into the Holy of Holies. So he goes in five times. Every time that he goes in, <clears throat> before he goes in, he's dressed in what's called his beautiful golden vestments that he has with the breastplate on, it's very splendid. That's before he goes in, but before he goes in. But in order to go in, he has to remove these garments, the splendid golden garments. And he even immerses himself in a mikvah and he puts on white garments. That's in order to, uh, uh, to achieve forgiveness for the Jewish people, etc., etc. Okay, let's just do one. Also, it says that I grabbed onto him and I not I won't let him go. The one who my soul loves. Remember, it means that the one that my soul loved. Kavar already. What do you mean the soul loves? Because the soul, especially the Jewish soul, but to a certain degree, every soul, before it's born, let's let's center on the Jewish people. And the the soul before it's it's born, it arose, it aroused, it arose, it arose in God's thought. The whole world was created from God's speech, but the Jewish people, they were in God's thought. So they were there, beloved by God before the world was created, before even the spiritual levels were created. And that's what King Solomon was saying. I searched for my my love, namely the soul. And I grabbed onto him and I took him into the, the room where I was born. We're going to see that's the Torah. Let's see. That's what it means. I am in exile on our kavar. This is the, something uh, Ezekiel said. I am in exile. It's talking about the soul. The soul it comes down into exile. but <clears throat> And it forgets this love. But it's there, it's, it's eternal. And after that, the soul finds this revealed love, then you have to grab onto it and bring it into the house of the your mother's house. That's the written Torah. And also into your father's house. That's the oral Torah, the Talmud, etc. That's the way to hold on to this love, Jews. Right? You can get it a little bit on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. You, you hear your father singing a song or something. You remember your grandmother's this, and you get aroused. And then it just goes away like it was nothing. Look what it says. Therefore, you have to take it into the Torah. That's what it says. The good, that's the holy garments of our own. That's the, our, the and so we have to take this in order to, to bring it into the Torah. So that's the importance of learning the Torah. That it's the garments for this love that's hidden in our souls. It was always there. It'll never go away. And we just have to find it, and that's our true identity. And that's this level of ale that's the source of the Jewish souls. Okay, now let's go to another mimer here in the Chod uh, Anila Dodi. Let's see if I can find this here. Yes, yes. All right, one more. Please bear with me. Here we go. We have 10 minutes to start this beautiful mimer. Eh, went too far. Oh, oh, here it is. What happened? Oh, here it is. Yes, yes.
Oh, go, we'll go back to where we were. Here we go. Next, this is the next mimer. This is the next mimer right after the one that we learned. Also talking about the month of Elul. Okay, I hope that these mimerim are taken seriously and, and we at least try to, to feel the closeness and the goodness of Hashem and that we're being created for a purpose. These things are really impossible to understand, but it's the truth. And here we see that it's, uh, this, is, this is the answer to our problems. And you might say, oh, come on, you know how many people there are in the world? How are they going to be? Don't worry about the other people in the world. You have to do what you do and God will do what he does. It's impossible. You cannot convince all the people in the world to believe in God, but God can. God can do all sorts of things. People will start to see how, how crooked that their leaders are of these different religions. And a lot of times, the, if, and if their leaders are not crooked, then the, the leaders themselves will realize the truth. What Judaism really is talking about, what God is really saying. And they'll tell all the people, listen, we, 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 made, we made a mistake. You know, we, we had good intentions. They're not going to get punished. You know, you, have, you believe the false religion all your life. You're not going to get punished. I don't know, maybe the missionaries, yeah, but the others not. Because they didn't try to take the Jews away from Judaism. They didn't try to, they just were tricked. They were tricked. Generation after generation are being tricked. Okay. Ani Dodi Dodi Lee. I am unto my beloved. My beloved is to me, Haro B'Shushanim, grazing in the roses. And if you remember at the end of the last mimer, I don't know why he didn't bring it here in this in the summary, but we said Haro means that we are the shepherds and we provide God these roses. What are the roses? The roses are the thirteen attributes that the Torah is learned by learning Torah. Learning Torah, written Torah, oral Torah. That's what we say. We, we actually nourish, so to speak, God. Makes it totally, I mean, the, God is not understandable. That There's no doubt about that. But that we provide for God, that's even more not understandable. But that's the whole idea of the Torah. And that we can repay God for what he's giving us. God is telling us how to repay him. Hine, Shushana, this, okay, so it says, I am to my, this is a sentence again in Song of Songs, King Solomon. I advise everyone to read it in English. Huh? You won't understand the word, but nevertheless, it's, it's interesting to read. You see that King Solomon was a very serious person, very serious person. And he wrote this book, not intending to be popular. I think if he was written, writing it to be popular, it would not be popular because it's just totally incomprehensible. <clears throat> but nevertheless, when you know that King Solomon is talking about the relationship between God and the Jews and Jews and God, and we love God and God loves us and <clears throat> we run away from God and God <clears throat> hides himself from us. And we have to search for him and God searches for us. And, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden it takes a sort of a new a mysterious and very interesting life. Song of songs. Look it over. I am to my to beloved, and my, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. Grazing in the flower, in the uh, roses. Hine Shoshana rose, Yeshlo Tulisar, only and has 13 petals. Kaneged Yud Gimel Mi, Machili, and Dorachim, corresponding to the 13 paths of mercy. Sheba Pasik, and these are hinted at in the sentence, Mi El Komocha, etc. We say this also in Tashlich, and also in the Pasak, Keo Rachum Hanun. 13 answer Bruce of mercy. Hashem Hashem, Kel Rachum Hanun, that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Shemisham, that this is the source of tshuva. This is the source of returning to God. The Odnose Oven, and God carries away all of your sins. Huh? That's a, whatever, what happens, what does a person do? What's the cure if a person sins? A person sins in Judaism. That's it. I mean, that's it. You, you went against the creator of the universe, huh? You can't be forgiven for anything like that. It's true. You can't, but God can. God forgives you. God forgives. God says in the Torah, if you genuinely re return back to me, I'll forget all the sins. That's it. Of course, if you, you, know, you stole money, you have to return the money. 
there's some sins that you can't, you know, you have to go to a, the, a genuine Kabbalist or something in order to know how to fix it up. But if you killed somebody, so you can't bring the person back. You know, you had illegitimate children, so they're here in the world. You know, you, you can't take them back. It says, nevertheless, God forgives everything that's possible to forgive. God forgives if you just turn to him. Ki mi Rosh Chodesh Elul. That's what happens on the month of Elul. On Rosh Chodesh Elul until after Yom Kippur, this is 40 days. These are the 40 days that Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, all of a shalom, that Moses of blessed memory, he went up to heaven to receive the last tablets. Just like the first days that Moses went up. Moses went up Mount Sinai three times, right? So the first time he went up, that was on uh, the holiday of, of, Sh of Shavuos. Moses went up to receive the first tablets. That's why we have the holiday of Shavuot. Moses went up. And then the Jewish people he came down 40 days later. The Jewish people found the Jewish people worshiping the golden calf. He went up a second time, another 40 days. And God forgave him. And then a, th a third time, 40 days. That's what it says, a robe shoshanim. That's what it means that he is a shepherd in the flowers. Don't say just the flowers, but it means mercy. That's what it means that I am to my beloved, to the beloved me. That's the first letters of Elul. Ani ladodi, the dodi li. The sentence continues that grazes in the roses. What's the connection between? Because in the month of Elul is revealed these 13 attributes of mercy. How to return to the Creator, the motivation to return to the Creator. But we have to understand Maoing and what is it, what exactly are these 13 attributes of mercy of God in the month of Elul? Bish Lama, we can understand in the 10 days SRMA Chuva and the days between. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Yitachen, we can understand. Yitachen, we can understand. That's, that's why we can understand why there's 13 attributes of mercy. Between Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, from Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of Rosh Hashanah to the end of Yom Kippur, that's, thir that's 10 days, what's called the 10 days of tshuva. Then you can understand that there's mercy being revealed. These are days of forgiveness and that God wipes out all the sins and etc. But why in the days of Elul? Uh, what's this got to do with 13 attributes of mercy in the month of Elul? It's not a holiday. It's not a special. That's how the other mimer started off also. What, what, so what's going on over here? Is it really being revealed? In Yenu, it's like this. Now, the Rebbe is not going to bring now the example of the king in the field. Hine and Tshuva. Eino alavonos. Repentance. So you'll see the word Tshuva doesn't really re mean repentance. It also includes the tshuva, returning to God, also includes doing, having repenting. Yes, if you did a sin, you say, okay, I, I was, I, I'm sorry, I, I lost control, or I did it on purpose, whatever it did, but I'm not going to do it again. That's it. It was a mistake. I'm sorry I did the mistake. I'm in your hands. That's what tshuva means. Re, re, returning to God. I'm, I'm in your hands. Just like before I was born, I was in your hands. Now I'm in your hands. I realized that I'm do, I did things my way. I completely messed up, drove on the wrong side of the street. I got uh, ran through uh, the shopping centers, right? I realized that I made big mistakes. Okay. And now, God, I'm putting myself back into your hand, whatever you want. That's called doing tshuva. Says the Rebbe, that's one aspect of tshuva, but tshuva doesn't have to be on sins. Davka. Shari, tzorich liyot, kol yom A person always has to be returning to God. Ella bechinas tshuva, because God creates it. When he created us, he put us in the body, and so we don't feel him. That means we, we, we want to feel him. That means returning to God. Who sheshav midarko arisho, and that means that a person just starts to change his attitudes and his ways. Like it says, like we, beg, we beg God at least three times a day, please return me to do tshuva before you. So you always have to do Tshuva. So now, now the thing is really not understandable. We have the 10 days of Tshuva from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Why only 10 days? Every day you're supposed to, 365, you're supposed to be doing Tshuva. 
It says, no, on, on those days, on the 10 days, that's when God's mercy is revealed. Says, that's also not true. God's mercy is revealed the whole entire month of Elul. So what's going on over there? All of a sudden, everything is just sort of falling apart. I thought the 10 days of tshuva, repentance, those were the days of tshuva. So no, every day has to be. And I thought that God was only revealed his 13 attributes of mercy on, on those 10 days. No, he's revealed the, the whole month of Elul also. Be in you, let's explain this. In the words of Rodal, there's two deos. There's two ways of looking at the world. One of them says in the Talmud, I'm, I'm, the, I'm sorry, there's two ways of looking at the Torah and the world and serving Judaism, serving God. One says that Torah learning is the greatest. And one says, no, the commandments are greater. What's greater, learning Torah or doing the commandments? So the rabbis argued, and they came to the conclusion, Bagomru Nimnu, they took a vote, and they, uh, they came to the conclusion, Talmud is good, learning Torah is greater. Why is learning Torah greater? Because without the Torah, you won't come to do the commandments. Maybe lead them myself. Negate the Torah, you negate the commandments. If you have Torah, then the Torah says you have to do this, you have to do this. So what does it mean? You have to put them in a, as a sign between your eyes and a thing on your arm. You have to keep the Shabbat. You, you, what, what does it mean? When you're supposed to have tzitzis, you're supposed to have mezuzah. What are these things? What am I supposed to do? When you have the Torah, then you come to do deed. If you don't have any Torah, you would never know that you have to do a commandment. Right? You know, there are no commandments. So the Torah is the greatest. Why? Because the Torah brings to do the commandments. So what's the greatest? Uh, the commandments are the greatest. The whole the Torah exists for the commandments. But nevertheless, the Torah is the most important. Without the Torah, you won't get the commandments. Well, Javi, and let's understand exactly what is the point of this argument. Why does it bring it in the Talmud? It says in the in the end of the Talmud in Kedushin. What is this? What the rabbis, they got nothing to do except argue about this. What's more important, Torah and the commandments? Such a big argument. But my common belief you, what are they arguing about? In order to understand this, first of all, we have to understand what it says at the Shemayim at the Oretz Ani Malay. It says, one sentence says, I, God is saying, I fill the heavens and the earth. In another place, it says, Malo Kol Oretz Kavodo. Another place it says that God himself, Ani, right? One sentence says, I fill the heavens and the earth. The other one says, no, Malo colors Kavoda, only God's glory fills the world. Veloniskar Shamayim. And it also says, God's glory fills the earth. It doesn't talk about the heavens. Here it says, the heavens and the earth I fill. And another sentence that says that God's glory fills the earth. And it doesn't mention heaven at all. And also on the first one, it says, I fill. And here it only says, my glory fills. So what's the difference between God's essence, his I, that fills the heavens and the earth? And another place it says, no, 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 no. Only my glory fills the earth. What about the heavens? Not clear. We're going to understand this and also the idea, all the questions that we asked. We'll understand this more, God willing, tomorrow. Now let's learn Dvar Malchut. Dvar Malchut this week is really something special. Shalom. Good morning. Uh, what am I doing here? Give me a second. Oh, here it goes. Good. So we're talking about this idea of Mashiach, and the Mashiach comes, the world is going to change, especially people will change. And people will change to the degree that we won't have to have any more policemen. There's just going to be judges telling you what to do, and there'll be advisors sort of telling you how to do it, and everyone will accept it. But the Rebbe says... This whole thing will be brought about 
What are we supposed to do now? Good, Mashiach is going to come, he'll do it. So let him do it. What do I have to do? Says the Rebbe, no, hey, you have to do the work. This whole idea of everyone wanting to do what God says, going to the judges, the rabbis, and asking them, please tell me what God wants. And then when the rabbi tells you, you go to a friend, to someone who becomes your advisor, and he says, listen, this is what the rabbi said. How do I do it? What, what am I supposed to do? In order to bring this about that everybody has this attitude of wanting to do what God says, how do we do this? Indian Zen Nifal by means of that the Jewish people now and every generation listen to the judges and the advisors of their generation. Like it says, that's what the sentence says, that you have to make for yourself these judges. This is Tzivu Ikaribi Yisodi. This is a very foundational essence of Judaism. Every place, every time, every even outside of Israel, every time, even now. <clears throat> and these, the, the, the judges, the rabbis of every generation that tell you what to do in the Torah. Now we're not, we're talking about genuine God-fearing rabbis who accept everything that the rabbis before them said. Or in short, short language, the Shulchan Aruch. Before they do anything, they look in the Shulchan Aruch and see what does the Shulchan Aruch say, and then they do it. And places where there are arguments at this, okay, those, those are the places where it's okay to have different opinions. You can go according to the one of the two opinions, five opinions. Sometimes there's customs, right? But those customs and those ideas are according to the Shulchan Aruch. You can't make up your own customs. Instead, let's make Shabbat is going to be from now on on Tuesday. And Shabbat is going to be music day. Shabbat, that's what Shabbat really means. It means music and love and enjoyment. You can't do that. You can't, you, you can't do that. That's destroying everything of the pre previous generations did. Hey, previous generation, what did they know? Did they, okay, that's the opposite of Judaism. Says and it's, it's the opposite way to bring Mashiach. The opposite of what's called tikkun olam. Tikkun olam means you have to do what the creator of the world says. Tikkun olam is means fixing the world. You have to do what the creator of the world says. You have to go according to the creator's, the, 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 the creator's instructions, manufacturer's instructions. So it says, therefore, how do you know what the God wants? You go to a rabbi who they really believe and follow what the previous rabbis who also believed and had the fear of God, they felt, and that's what's been passed on, that's what kept, has been keeping Judaism going for the last 3,300 years. Right? If, if, if Jews had not been keeping the Torah, it's the only thing that keeps Jews going. They just intermarry and that's it, they're finished. Like it says in our Torah Porsche, so now what do we have to do? You have to go to the judges in your time and they have to tell you what the law is. And you have to do whatever they tell you. Every single generation is like Shmuel, Samuel, the prophet, in his generation. And like Moses in his generation. A rabbi, when you go, a genuine rabbi, when he's appointed to be a rabbi, it's different than like a Rosh Hashiva, a, a genius in Torah. A rabbi has help from God. A person can know the whole entire Torah, all of the laws and everything, and nevertheless, he has to go to a rabbi to ask his questions. <clears throat> That's the whole idea of the judge. This is what's going to bring the, the Mashiach, who's going to be the ultimate judge. We'll talk about this. This is when, in addition to the fact that you, the, the judges, that comes from him, all sorts of, good advice and salvation that in addition to this and the, the judge and the rabbi who tells you what to do in your generation and also the advisors they'll give you advice on how to be more god fearing and to serving god and by means of this commandment of your judges namely go according to the rabbis the genuine rabbis of your time then 
you go according to what the Torah says, and also going according to what your advisors tell you to do, this makes a vessel, in fact, an inner vessel, in order to accept what's going to be in the future that Isaiah prophesized. God says, I will return your judges, like in the beginning, and your advisors, your advisors, in the onset, that everything God will make, you do your little thing, and God will make it big miracles, and that there will be the true judges, and there will be the true advisors, and everyone will want to do what's right. Right, just like in every country in the world, people drive on the right side of the street. Right? Why do they drive on the right side of the street? Why don't you get people to drive on the wrong side of the street? Right? Most people, even in the middle of the night when the streets are abandoned, they drive on the right, on the correct side of the street. Why do they do it? Because they realize it's for their own benefit. Well, what's the point? Why should I drive on the wrong side of the street? What am I going to get out of it? But right, just, just to drive on the wrong side of the street because I want to, right? Because I want to. It's, is it really worth it? So the same thing, the whole world will do what it says in the Torah. They'll just drive on the wrong, right side of life. Dugma, similarly, is also one of the differences between the words of the Torah and the prophets. Now we're going to get to prophecy. Prophecy is taught, that's, we just taught, finished learning that in the Chumash class, right? Uh, prophets. It says that God is going to make true prophets. You don't have to go to the necromancers and to the, to the false prophets and to the the, the, the crystal ball gazers and the, the, the astrologers. and God says, I'm going to give you a true prophet. And we're going to see that every generation, even now, there are true prophets. The Torah is above the world. The Torah is the wisdom and the will of God. The Torah is above any connection to the world. Just like there's no thought that can possibly grasp God at all, even though the, the Torah came down. And it is <clears throat> supposed to be understood until a person can learn Torah and the Torah is called on that person's name, Taurus Moshe, for instance. But nevertheless, the Torah in its essence is the Torah of God, totally above understanding. And that, we could, that which we can understand, that's an amazing miracle. That which we can understand, the, mir the arguments between the rabbis and the Talmud, this is a miracle. I mean, you should understand that it says that the least powerful, the least holy, if you want to call it, of the Tanayim, the people who wrote the Mishnahs and the Brises, they could raise the dead. They could raise the dead. There are stories in the Talmud of, of people, Rebbe Yehuda, the pupils of Rebbe Yehuda, that they raised the dead. So these people, they weren't just arguing about, you know, nitpicking, you know, how they say how many angels can dance in the head of a pit. Here, these people, are, they were arguing about really what God wants us to do. And each one got his inspiration from God. All the words in the Talmud are all the words of God. I, it doesn't look like any of the Bibles that the non-Jews have. When someone comes along, this is the truth, this is the way. Here's the, all these arguments going back and forth, bizarre stories. That's what God made. God made a very bizarre world. And to fix this world up, that's what the, all the weird stories are in the Talmud. That's what Judaism believes. And therefore, therefore, the way that the world affects the world is mainly, the, but, but essentially the Torah is totally above understanding. Therefore, the way that the Torah works in the world is by means of commands. God decides what to do and you have to do it, which is not the case prophecy. Prophecy is a little bit different. Prophecy, even though the prophecy is the word of God, and we're talking about the prophets after Moses, Prophecy, even the prophecy is the word of God. The whole Torah is the prophecy of Moses. God speaking through Moses. Nevertheless, it's the word of God. It's the revelation of God to the prophets. This is revealing his secrets through his servants, the prophets. Begidram Haim in their different natures. Each prophet had a different nature, right? Amos was different from Micha, and Micha was different from Yeshaya, and Shaya was different from Yechezko, and Yechezko was different from Yermio, etc. Even though there are conditions to be a prophet, not everybody that stands up 
and you know gets wild how do you say spasms of uh, of uh, in intuition <clears throat> he can be a prophet maybe you can write books right you can write a book you can write you know a stream of consciousness books or something but you're not a a prophet there's conditions to be a prophet a prophet is a person who has to be wise he has to know the whole torah he has to be gibor he has to be not afraid of anybody of anything etc there's a lot of conditions. The main condition he has to know all of the Torah and he has to be a God fearing person. This has to be, in, in the, 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 the prophet has to understand this, but often in a way, that the prophet actually unites with his prophecy. It goes into his mind. That's why they say that the, the way of speaking, the prophecy of Isaiah. It was in very, very uh, eloquent language because he, he came from a very royal family, which is different, let's say, than the prophecy of Ovadia. Right? But nevertheless, they were all the word of God. But they, the word of God came through these prophets through their particular personality. But God, also their thoughts and their speech, etc., is the word, the spirit of God speaking through them. And his, God's words are on my tongue. That's the idea of a prophet. Prophecy has to come in a revealed way through speech. Every language, call us a nevua, the whole expression, what does it mean, a nevua? What does it mean, nevua? A navi, a prophet, navi, means a person, machriz, announces, umashmia, and lets something be known, announces, and makes known a message to the people. That's a Navi. The woman is there is Neves of a time. It comes from the language of the, the movement of my lips. Speech of my lips. Not like the Torah. The Torah can be uh, remain in thought. And also the right the tongue. So prophecy has to come out in speech. Also <clears throat> The message that prophets give over has a relevance to the world. Prophets only come either to strengthen the observance of Torah and the commandments or to let us know future things, right? Isaiah came and warned the people if they don't do repent and that they're going to be spread all over the world, etc. Yeshlomo, we can say, that the Torah and prophecy, they are, <clears throat> this is sort of like the difference between Shoftan, the judges, and the advisors. A judge, his thing is to tell what the Torah is. What, the, what does the Torah say? What does God say? That this, that there was the connection, we said this before, a judge, his connection is with God and the Torah. God and the Torah. Not so much of a connection with the litigants, the litigants just come and he just looks. It doesn't make any difference who the litigants are, how they are. What He just says, if this person does this and this person does this, and this is the evidence and this is the cases, he looks in the Torah and says, this is the law. Whether they're poor, whether they're rich, whether they're powerful, whether they're not. We learned in this week's portion, Torah portion, you're not supposed to have mercy on the, on the, on the, on the in, in a judgment. The judgment is, you, you tell them what the Torah says. This is a decree from the Torah. If the Torah gives you a leeway and says that you can be lenient, then you're lenient. Like I said, Rabbi Akiva said that if he would have lived in the days when there was the death punishment, when a death punishment was carried out, that nobody would ever die. He would always found some sort of a loophole in the, in the testimony or something like that. So there's places where you can find. But nevertheless, the main thing is that, that a judge his whole thing is God and the Torah. He just tells everybody what God and the Torah. A yoetz, an advisor, an advisor, he gives an advice and he puts it into a way that a person will understand. We already talked about this. That's the same thing as the prophet. The prophet, he is not, he's not a judge. A prophet, he gives the advice how to deal with things in the world, things that are going to be in the world. Like, for instance, 
this is a particular place, this is where you should go. Now today you should make a war. You shouldn't make a war. That's what a prophet is. And just like there is that you have to listen to the prof, the, the, the judges in all the times, like it says in Obal, a shofet, a share, yebi, also that you have to listen to the prophets. And no the prophets. Like it says, Bahamshek, it says, Novi Mikir Bacha Bachacha Khamoni. He said, in, in this week's Torah portion, we learned this just a couple of days ago in the Chumash class. <clears throat> God said, don't go to the, to the sorcerers and these people, the, 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 the crystal gazers, whatever. I'm going to give you a prophet. And <clears throat> Kamoni, he will do the word of God. You have to listen to him. Just like you have to listen. And just like the Rambam writes, Maimonides, Besheth Ramada, says that one of the foundations of the Jewish religion is to know that God gives prophecy to people. It's one of the 13 principles of faith. We're to, we'll really talk about this. It's a commandment to listen to the prophet. Now, who is the prophet? Oh, in other words, you can't just do what you want to. <clears throat> you can't pick a nice guy, an intelligent person, and he'll tell you what to do. You're, you, there's a prophet in every generation, at least one, and you have to listen to what he says. How are you going to know who it is? Even in the Torah, it says there's false prophets. Huh? One of the ways you can know if he tells if he tells you to go against the Torah, if he says to go against anything in the Shulchan Aruch, you know that he's a false prophet. Anything whatsoever. You don't have to put on tefillin. You don't have to keep Shabbos anymore. That's a false prophet. That's a false prophet. But in, another, in addition to that, if he tells future things that are going to be, and they don't come to be, sense that the Rambam brings this in the book of, in, in his book of 14 volumes of laws, all the laws of Judaism. And he also brings this thing about listening to the prophet. He brings this law and he brings it in, in great detail. And even more, he says, this is one of the foundations of Judaism. So it's understood that this is a law which is relevant to the Jewish people in all of the generations, even though that the rabbis say that <clears throat> after the last prophets passed away, when did the last prophets pass away? In the beginning of the first temple. Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi, these were people of the great assembly also. In the time of Mordechai and this. It says that when these last prophets died, Nistalka Ruach HaKodesh Mizrael, the spirit of holiness, prophecy, departed from the Jewish people. You know, so it departed. The, the, how can the Rebbe say that there's prophets right now? How can the Rambam say that there's prophets? You have to listen to the prophet. It says the Rebbe said, we spoke about this. What does it mean that it, it went away? Istalak? It doesn't say that it was negated. It just temporarily went away. It just departed temporarily. Low butlet, it's not that it was stopped or paska, right? Or it ceased. Like it says also that after that, we if we find that the after the first, after the, the second temple, even after the second temple was destroyed, we find a lot of people that had prophecy. Many people, like it's also understood in the the, the Rambam, the Rambam wrote, this is a, a law book, the Sifro Halachot, we find that there was prophecy among the Tanaim, the, one, the, 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 the wise men of the Torah, the Talmud, Mishnah. And the Rambam also, interestingly enough, he doesn't bring any condition. He brings the conditions of prophecy, but he doesn't say that, that, that it doesn't exist anymore. It, it, or, or when the last prophets, it doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't bring that. And even more, the Rambam, usually when there's a law that's not applicable anymore, like for instance, there's the law that it says you're not allowed to get married to a, a Moabite. You're not allowed, right? You're not allowed, says, but the Rambam says, but there doesn't exist anything anymore. You, they don't exist anymore. The Ishmael, they have a commandment that you have to circumcise them. But he says, but there's no more Ishmael anymore. They don't, nobody knows who they are. After the... In the middle of the first temple came along Sanchirav. He, he confused the whole world. As nobody, nobody knows who Yishmael is. But as, prof, as prophecy goes, he doesn't give any says that there's no such thing as prophecy. The Rambam writes in the letters of Taman that in a certain year, that prophecy will come back to the Jewish people. And there's no doubt 
that returning back of prophecy to the Jewish people, this is a preparation for Mashiach. Now, again, I want to stress again that this idea of prophecy can only come to a Jew that does all of the Torah and the commandments according to the Shulchan Aruch. If a person just gets some sort of inspiration or something, or he finds, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls say this and that, right? That's not accurate, right? These people did not do all the Torah and the commandments. I mean, you can see that. They're just take a simple example, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They couldn't even write the book of Psalms right. They got everything wrong. And these people, it seems that they did the Torah and the commandments. But you can't trust a person. If he doesn't do Torah and commandments, you can maybe you can trust him in business, you can trust him all around, but you cannot trust him in matters of Judaism. What he says is meaningless. He's certainly not a prophet. He can give you good advice. If you want, sure, you can take advice from anybody. But a prophet that's going to tell you what to do is only a Jew that keeps all of the Torah and the commandments according to the Shulchan Aruch. Like it says, it says, and this is going to return in the days of the Mashiach. Yeshlam, we can say that this is explained, like we said many times, says, your advisors, like in the beginning, that in order that we can receive the revelations in the days of the Mashiach, the changes that are going to be in our personality and in the world, in the revelation of the Creator in the days of the Mashiach, in order to accept this, we have to have, first of all, preparation. What's the preparation? <clears throat> we have to have prophets. And these prophets, and the Rebbe's going to say, you're going to see in a minute, the Rebbe's going to say that he's a prophet. We're going to listen. Hamshach has Eitza Shemit Kabelet. He has to give advice, which is accepted by people in a way which is relevant <clears throat> to Tehillah. It's the onset. This makes it possible then he can receive in an inner way that he's waiting for, and he can receive these revelations that are going to be in the days of the Mashiach, whether the Shoftayach, that he's going to want the judges to tell him what to do, he's going to want the rabbis to tell him what to do, and he's going to want his advisors to tell him how to do it. Therefore, it's a law in our generation, even now, and it's one of the foundations of Judaism that God gives prophecy to people. That it's always, in all the generations, relevant that there can be prophecy below until a pro level of prophecy that's even something like even the prophecy of Moses. A prophet I will give to you among your brothers like you. The complete idea of prophecy. Of course, after Moses gave his prophecy in the Torah, no one can change that. That you can't change. But it'll still be the level of holiness like Moses. And according to this, Yeshlam, we can say that the reason that the Rambam takes so long as far as the prophecy of Moses is, <clears throat> right? Why does the Rambam talk about the greatness of Moses? And Moses was a different prophet than anybody else. And he was, you know, why, why does he care? This is supposed to be, it's supposed to be a law book. The Rambam is <clears throat> a law, he's not telling us history, what was already was. Why do we care in a book that's laws? The Rambam is like a, a Kitzur Shohan Orach, just telling you laws what to do. It's a book of laws. Why do we care about that Moses was a prophet like this and that he was a different type of a prophet? And if this is re re relevant to the time of the days of the Mashiach, when Moshe will be like them. So we'll see this ourselves. Right? We'll see if we're going to say that Moses is great. And why is he telling us this? Because in the days of the Mashiach, there's going to be the raising of the dead and Moses will stand up. So we'll know what to expect. What do we care about this in the book of laws? We'll see it when Moses comes. It's not necessary. What do we have to know about that at one? Now, the Rebbe said very simply, in all of the generations, even before Moses rises up from the dead, it's relevant to the laws to know that God gives prophecy to people. Every generation must have a prophet. Reveal godliness in a way of prophecy until the complete holiness that was by Moses. And even more, in every generation, there has to be a prophet like you. That's what it says in the Torah. This is this week's Torah portion. God said, in every generation, there is going to be a prophet like you, Moses, from Avur, like it says in the Rambam. Now, that's essentially all the Rebbe's of Chabad. 
they brought a whole new way, a whole new attitude into the world of how to serve the creator, Jews and non-Jews as well. Non-Jews have to know that God is one and that God is creating them and that God loves them, just like Jews do. And the, uh, the details, what they have to do is, is different. The non-Jews have seven Noahide commandments. Some people say they have 40. The Jews have 613 and they have all the commandments of the rabbis. But basically it's the exact same thing. God is create, commanding his creations to serve him. And you don't know how to do it unless there is a prophet in your generation to inspire you, to change you, to make you not satisfied with the world the way it is. That's why the prophet, any prophet that stands after Moses, as we don't believe him because of some sort of miracles he does, but because there's a commandment, a commandment of Moses in the Torah that you must believe in the prophets. Kolomer, in other words, shall call Navi that every prophet that exists in every generation is just like a branch of the prophecy of Moses and his Torah. But in a revealed way, there happen to be different things. Like what the Rambam says, Isaiah was different from Ezekiel. In our generation, who is our prophet? In our generation, says the Rebbe, it's the previous Rebbe. Rebbe Yosef Yitzchak, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe. Here he is. Picture of your savior. That's the prophet of our generation. And the Rebbe always said about himself, that he's just an extension of the previous Rebbe. He's just carrying out the work that the previous Rebbe gave over to him. Started. Well, and afterwards, Sheikh Hosea ben Avud, that prophecy has come back to the Jewish people, that this is a prop that says, when will prophecy come back? This is a preface to the Mashiach. That's what the Rambam says. That the prophecy that will be by the Mashiach, the Mashiach, he will be even greater than Moshe. That it says that the Mashiach will be even greater than Moshe. There's different, different uh, version. And the rabbis say that the first redeemer, that's Moses, he's going to be the last redeemer, the Mashiach. Even though Moses was from the tribe of Levi, and Mashiach is from the tribe of Judah, Yehuda, but <clears throat> there'll be a spark of Moses in the Ubakal, Dorvador, in every single generation. There is some one person that is fit to be the Mashiach. And therefore, we have to know that the law, that even nowadays, it, before the redemption, there is a prophet. There is a prophet by the Mashiach, even before the redemption. The prophecy of the level of Mashiach is here, in every generation it's here. Something like we said before, the onset, Yoatzayach Kavatchila that this complete revelation of prophecy that will be, now we have a little bit of it, and it'll be completely revealed after the Mashiach redeems all the Jewish people. I know, if you've ever seen, it's just incredible, if you've ever seen the letters that the Rebbe answered to people, the amazing things, I mean, it's just unheard of. I, I just read of stories about this lady, I think I told you about it, that like 15 doctors told her that she couldn't have any, the biggest professors. The Rebbe said, go to doctors. And she went to doctors, she came back and said, that the, all the doctors say the same thing, one after another, that I have to make an operation and that I can never have children. And the Rebbe said, listen, don't listen to those doctors. Do me a favor, please. So what can I do? You know, all the doctors say I'm dying. I got to make this operation quick. And, and as far as children goes, I'm never going to have any children. The Rebbe said, listen, do me a favor. Just pick out one really, really good doctor, a really big professor, and go to him. She went to the professor, and the professor said, I understand. He said, the Lubavitcher Rebbe sent you to me. He said, but all these other professors, let me see the papers. He said, I understand what the other professors said, but I just gave you a checkup, and I'm telling you what you have to do. This is my opinion. You have to go home and get in bed and not get out of bed because you're pregnant. And sure enough, she gave birth to a, a child, child, I think, a boy. And she, after that, she gave birth to two children. And she didn't have to make an operation or nothing. She spoke herself when she was speaking. She must have been, I don't know, 70 years old. Eight years. The Rebbe, the Rebbe said that the Six-Day War was nobody was going to get hurt. And the, the, the Gulf War, no. Incredible. The, 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 I'm sorry, that the, the Six-Day War was going to end in six days. There wouldn't, it would be an amazing miracles. 
And then the Gulf War, he said nobody would get hurt. But how could he be so sure? No one in the world agreed with him that the Iron Curtain was going to fall. So we'll see after the Mashiach comes and there'll be this revelation of prophecy that it won't be a new thing. But there was already, we we're beginning this now. The onset was beginning before the redemption. In fact, every generation there was someone like that. Therefore, the Rambam writes in his book of laws, because it's a very important law, especially the Rambam writes in his book, the laws which are, in the end, he writes the laws which are relevant to the Mashiach. And now these laws, he writes way before that, right in the beginning of his book, because this is a preface and a preparation and a, a, a merit that's going to bring the Mashiach, namely, listening to the prophet of your generation. Says the Rebbe, who is the prophet of our generation? It is the previous Rebbe. And of course, the Rebbe is speaking about himself, which that we're going to talk about God willing tomorrow. But now let's learn Hayom Yom. Oh, by the way, I discovered something. Last time I sounded the chauffeur, right? Well, I discovered that the uh, microphones can only take a certain amount of decibels. I don't know what it is. And they cut off. So if you listen to the sounding of the chauffeur, it cuts off in the middle. That was not part of the chauffeur sounding. It went doof. That's not part. I'm going to try it again. We'll see if it works. I'll do it quite more quietly. Yom Yom, whoever has faith in what's called Hashgacha Pratit, that everything that happens in the world is designed and directed by God, and it's part of a huge, amazing plan that if every detail affects the whole entire world. We just have to know how to react. Every, so there we know that man's steps are also established by God, that every single soul has to purify and improve something specific in a particular place. So if you miss your bus or you happen to whatever, don't spend the whole time just cursing and getting all angry and, and, and wrecking the bus stop or something. Don't do that. You have to know that the reason you're there is for some reason, right? It's for a, a positive purpose. You're supposed to meet somebody. You're just supposed to stand there and say words of Torah for centuries or even since the world's creation, thousands of years, whatever has to be purified or improved waits for you to come and purify it and improve it. The soul also has been waiting up in heaven since it came into being for the come to come down in the world to descend so that it can start, it can do the tasks of purification that it was created to do. Let's try selling to the show. Let's see if it works this time. A little quiet. <laughs> Okay, have a good day with Mashiach now. I hope to see you at 3 o'clock.